But let's begin our worship today with our simple weekly ritual of lighting our chalice flame. And for those of you at home, if you'd like to light a flame with me, then please do so now. And let us reflect today on the meaning for us of this simple, single light. And I invite you, if you would like to, if you're in the room, just to call out a word of something that is symbolic for you in the light. And if you're online, just to pay, maybe write something in the chat box about what this light symbolizes for you. Just a word will do. Hope. Gratitude. Inspiration. Freedom. joy. Eternity and pathway and constancy. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on the meaning of this very simple flame that we've lit to bring us all together into this space today. And Following on from that, I invite you to join with me in singing our first hymn. Um, it's in the purple hymn books. There are purple hymn books at the back if you want one, but the words will also come up on the screen. Um, so if you don't have one, don't worry. And this is hymn number 158. And it's the flame of truth is kindled. We didn't say truth, but truth can also be something that this light might symbolize for us. So let's join in singing 158.
let us come to a time of prayer. And if you're new here, there's no particular way of being during prayer other than just still and quiet, but do sit in whatever way feels comfortable for you. Spirit of life and love, may you be present with us now. We give thanks for all the blessings in our lives today. And we honour all the sadness that's with us too. We bring into this space those we know who are suffering in any way at this time. We think of those members of the congregation who are unable to be with us through ill health. Particularly at this time, Thelma and Christoph. And we pray for Cliff, whose wife, Mary, sadly passed away this week. May they and we all be held in love and in light. We ask too that you are present with all who are suffering from acts of violence at this time. In Ukraine, in Afghanistan, in Syria, in anywhere in the world where there is conflict. May you lift up the hearts of those who are afraid and inspire courage among the peacemakers. May you be present with our political leaders, guiding them away from violence and towards peace. Guide to the hands of all those who are caring for the injured, the hungry, the displaced and the grieving. and open our hearts to compassion. Point us towards generous engagement and fill us with a vision of hope and of peace. May it be so. Amen. Now I said that we would be looking at festival and um, 
you may think that's a bit strange in the middle of Lent, but then Lent itself is a festival of a different kind. Um, but I thought we might share the story behind the festival of Holi. The Hindu carnival of Holi, which as I said, takes place on Friday, gets its uh, name and is inspired by um, legends, one of which is the story of Prahlad and Holika, from whom the festival gets its name. And so our first reading will be the story uh, which Sheila is going to read for us now. The story of Holly. A long time ago in India, there was a king who had a son called Prahlad. The king wanted everyone to think of him as God and to worship him. But as Prahlad began to grow up, he began to realise, as children do, that this was not quite true. So he refused to worship his father. He worshipped Vishnu instead, a real god. The king was very angry. He scolded and punished his son. However, Prahlad still refused to worship him. So the king, who was not a reasonable man, decided that his son must die. The king tried many different and cruel ways to kill Prahlad. He was put in a pit full of snakes. He was beaten by soldiers and he was trampled by elephants. But each time Prahlad prayed to the god Vishnu and miraculously he was saved. The king became more and more angry. Finally, in desperation, the king asked his sister, Holika, to help him. Now, Holika was believed to have magical powers which made her fireproof. She could stand in flames and remain untouched by them. So Holika took Prahlad to the top of a large bonfire, which was then lit. Everyone including the king and Holika herself, expected Prahlad to die and Holika to survive. But instead, as the flames licked around them, it was Holika who died, while Prahlad was saved once more by Vishnu. In spite of everything, Prahlad felt sorry for Holika and promised to name a festival after her. And this is why every year at the time of Holly, Hindus light bonfires to remind them of the time when good triumphed over evil. Thank you, Sheila. When I asked Sheila to read that, she said it's a bit grisly. And it's a bit grisly, but then a lot of our um, Religious stories in all faiths can be quite grisly, and um, maybe that's a reflection of life too. Our reading, second reading, is um, from someone called Ron Osborne, who edits a magazine called Spectrum, a religious magazine. And um, he's quoting a book or a bit from a book called A Secular Age. And that's written by the Canadian Catholic philosopher, Charles Taylor. And uh, this book was something that I studied as part of my training, actually. It was uh, it's a great big thick tome of a book. And it, um, it's a really interesting look at how, how um, we have moved over the centuries from being predominantly religious societies, at least in the West, to predominantly secular. Um, so, just a bit of background to, to this reading. In his acclaimed book, A Secular Age, the Canadian Catholic philosopher Charles Taylor 
devotes a surprising number of pages to the phenomenon of the medieval carnival and similar festivals of misrule in numerous cultures. At certain periods in many pre-modern societies, the normal order would be temporarily suspended, reversed, inverted, undone. Bulls would be made king for a day. Boys would be given mitres and anointed bishops. The authorities would be openly cursed and mocked. It's quite like today, isn't it? <laughs> and young people, especially unmarried males, would be granted license to engage in sexual or even near violent transgressions of accepted moral codes. Yet all of this mockery of good standards, decency and virtue was paradoxically in support of order and morality. The guardians of virtue permitted and even encouraged carnival, although there were always some stern moralizers who tried to suppress this, because they understood that structure needs anti-structure, that society needs escape valves. The weight of virtue and good order was so heavy and so much steam built up under this suppression of instinct, Taylor writes, that there had to be periodic blowouts if the whole system were not to fly apart. There was a deeper meaning, though, to these occasions of socially sanctioned and ritualized mayhem. In the medieval social imaginary, chaos is dangerous and must be contained. But order constantly threatens to become rigid, repressive, and deadening. Order can therefore only survive by being periodically plunged back into the energies of primal chaos. Back into those ungoverned and ungovernable forces that are always present beneath the surface and that supply society with its creativity and dynamism. Without allowance for temporary disorder and misrule, life could become unbearable and political and religious orders would become totalitarian. So something to think about there with the role of festivals in our lives, but we'll come back to that later. For now, let us sing again and I suppose in the spirit of festivity, um, I chose this hymn, which is number 133 in the hymn books. It's play trumpet, cello, harp and flute. So this is hymn number 133.
Let us come now to a time of quiet reflection. And this is time for you to use for your own prayer, for your own meditation. Simply to sit and be still. To think your own thoughts or no thoughts at all. So the word carnival traditionally refers to the season of feasting and celebration that takes place immediately before Lent, which ends with Shrove Tuesday or Mardi Gras. I mean, we don't really do much for that here now today. Um, might make a few pancakes perhaps, but you know, Mardi Gras is a huge festival. And such carnival has been celebrated particularly in Catholic countries since medieval times and has always been associated with wearing masks and costumes and overturning the social conventions with dancing, parades, and general messing about. One of these carnivals is the Carnival of Venice, which is still famous for its exquisite masks, which began in the 12th century and does still continue. So both the Festival of Purim and the Festival of Holi are joyous celebrations, and they both do involve masks and parades and the flouting of social conventions. So Purim, as you may know, is based on the events of the book of Esther in the Hebrew Bible. And it's a story in which the Jewish heroine, Esther, persuades her husband, the king, to prevent a Persian nobleman called Haman from massacring the Jews in his kingdom. And the festival of Purim, therefore, is a time of praise and thanksgiving and the book of Esther is usually read in the synagogue and the congregation might use rattles or cymbals and pantomime boos to drown out Haman's name whenever it's mentioned which it is a lot in the story and it's also a time of feasting and drinking and in Israel there are street parades in which people of all ages, from babies to grandparents, will dress up in colourful costumes. And for Holly, the celebrations begin the day before with the Holika bonfire that we heard about in the story, um, where people gather and sing and dance. And then the next morning is a, just a free for all of colour, where people play and chase each other and throw pigments, colored pigments and colored water over each other using sometimes water pistols or balloons filled with colored liquid. Um, it's mayhem. And anyone and everyone is fair game. So you can throw your paint over your boss 
You can throw it over your friend or a stranger, whether they're rich or poor, women, men, children, elders, in the streets, in the parks, outside the temples. And there are groups carrying instruments, drums, from place to place to help with the singing and the dancing. And then later, when things calm down a bit, people will visit friends and family and share food in the best tradition of all festivals. And like Easter, the festival signifies the good of, or the success of good over evil. It's also about the arrival of spring, the end of winter, and a festive day in which there's a chance to play and laugh and forget and forgive, and particularly to repair any ruptured relationships. There's nothing like dissolving the social norms and encouraging everyone to just get together for healing, actually. So both Purim and Holi are important outlets. They're opportunities for exuberance, a chance to release and to let go. Now, last week I mentioned the wonderful Songlines exhibition that I know some of you went to see uh, at the box. Um, a wonderful exhibition of contemporary Australian Aboriginal art. And for those of you who didn't see it, the artists offered a brilliant, I thought, reimagining of an ancient story, an ancient creation myth called the Seven Sisters. So just um, bear with me while I do this little detour and it will bring us back to festivals again. This is a story about seven mythical women, the sisters, and one male trickster. And there's a subversive element right there. And the story explains how the land was formed. For example, as the sisters flew and traveled across the land, following the song lines, at one point, the trickster turns them into trees. And then you can still see the trees on the landscape today. And at other points, they would sit and eat and stir their sticks into the ground, creating water holes, which you can still, still see on maps today. And eventually, the women, after a lot more adventures, fly up into the sky where they form stars which we now call the Pleiades. So the story is describing how the land came to be the way it is. And one of the artists described how she felt that the paintings that they were creating out of this story were coming to them, not sort of through their minds or from the ether, but up from the ground, as though the land was still speaking to them today. And I was really struck by this idea because the original story had, of course, of the Seven Sisters, it was inspired by the landscape, although it was describing how the landscape or imagining how the landscape had been formed. So there was this cyclical relationship between the landscape and the storytelling. And now it seemed as though the land was again suggesting to these artists a new expression, which in turn again was revealing to them more about the meaning and the relationship with the land. It's a process that may continue and cycle on indefinitely. And I mention this because to go back to the point that we humans are meaning makers by nature. And religious festivals, which are based on ancient stories, seem to me to be part of this rich meaning making work that we do. 
It is spiritual work. The stories we tell may not come directly from the land in quite the same way as the Aboriginal stories do, but nevertheless, they have emerged from the extremely fertile ground of our lived experience. Our religious stories have been created out of the challenges and the conflicts and the births and the deaths, the journeys and the whole range of emotions, anger, jealousy, grief, love of our ancestors and of their relationship with the divine. And these stories continue to reflect us back to ourselves over and over again, each time we tell them and retell them. I think it's why a parable from the Gospels or stories such as those told at Purim and Holi continue to have such relevance and such resonance. Because when will we ever stop needing stories about good defeating evil? And when will we ever stop needing outlets for our fears and our frustrations or new ways to overcome them? And when will we fully understand our relationship with the divine? Never. And yet our religious festivals help us along that journey. And they're so important because they remain alive not just because we repeat them each year, but because we continue to reinterpret them and understand ourselves better as a result. Our spiritual stories continue to breathe up through us and we continue to breathe them back into the world, subtly transformed each time and we ourselves subtly transformed each time and that happens very often through the medium of some kind of festival of course it's true that some of our festivals may have evolved in part at least to keep us in line and maintain the status quo to give us safe outlets and then put us back in our boxes again. I'm sure the medieval bishops knew what they were about there. And the critics of organised religion may well make that case. But what we choose to do with these extraordinary stories and festivals, these great riches that we've inherited, that is very much up to us to choose. Their potential is still here for them to work their magic on us, to allow the ground, both the ground beneath our feet and the ground of our being, to allow the ground to speak its truth through us and to bring new lights and fresh understanding to our lives. So happy Purim and happy Holi. And amid these wilderness weeks of Lent, as Jennifer reminded us recently, bookended as they are by the wilder celebrations of Mardi Gras and Easter Sunday, May we find new meaning once more for ourselves in these stories, in these festivals, new meaning for ourselves and new hope for the world. The ancient stories and festivals we continue to retell and relive have the potential to re-narrate our relationship with life itself. It's not just that we retell them, but they retell us. 
if we let them. May it be so. Our final hymn today is hymn number 195. It is, We Sing a Love That Sets All People Free. And I think this is also part of what our festivals are trying to do and help us to do, to set ourselves and each other free. So let's sing hymn number 195, We Sing a Love that sets all people free. be seated. Our closing words today come from Celia Cartwright, Unitarian minister and um, erstwhile president. Let us go in peace to live together in harmony to see beauty in everything, to know wonder in each passing moment and to walk gently with our God. Amen. In a moment, um, we will have our closing credits and then uh, some music. And the, the music is a Kletzmer band. Um, there will be Kletzmer bands playing for Purim, uh, Jewish musical tradition. 
with singing and dancing, you may feel like moving. I leave that up to you. Um, and then after that, Sheila will share the notices if you'd like to stay. And there will be breakout rooms available for people who are online and tea and coffee here. But first, let us just remember the words that we've just heard to walk gently with our God, to be gentle with ourselves, with whatever is happening at the moment for us and in the world. Let it be so.